At the University of Pittsburgh, we are fortunate to have truly outstanding faculty that make meaningful contributions to advancing knowledge and increasing our understanding. A few faculty stand out as they make the greatest contributions, asking new questions, opening new avenues of thought, and making us look at the world in a different way. For these individuals, the university has a special designation, the appointment to a distinguished rank. This is the highest recognition the university can afford to its staff. As many of you already know, Dr. Fu is one of these exceptional professors who has advanced the field of orthopedics through his leadership, his research, and his training of others. And so it is very fitting that his distinguished colleagues have recommended him for this appointment. Dr. Fu is the David Silver Professor and Chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery since 1998 and is the world's foremost authority on ACL reconstruction, having done a great deal to advance the individualized anatomic ACL reconstruction concept. He also holds appointments as a professor of mechanical engineering and material science in the Swanson School of Engineering and as a professor of sports medicine and nutrition in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. He was awarded the university's prestigious 225 medallion in 2012, the 2000 Philip Hench Distinguished Alumnus Award from the School of Medicine. He holds honorary doctorates from Point Park University and Chatham University and was awarded the Chancellor's Public Service Award from this university. He has also been named a top 100 Pittsburgher of the century in 1999, and the Pittsburgh Ballet has even dedicated a performance to him. This year, by proclamation of the Pittsburgh City Council, September 13th was named Dr. Freddie Fu Day. As is our custom, we present this medallion from the University of Pittsburgh to Dr. Freddie Fu as we officially recognize him as a Distinguished Service Professor of Orthopedic Surgery. Hello, I'm Freddie Fu. I'm so privileged uh, to give this lecture concerning orthopedic research in Pittsburgh for the last 60 years. In 2010, uh, I was named one of only eight distinguished surface professor School of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. I feel in awe, uh, standing tall with Tom Stasso, Bernie Fisher, Richard Simmons, Aki Grinvitt, and Julius Younger. And of course, uh, Dr. Tom Detry and Peter Salver, who are truly giants in our field. And I feel like that is not a personal recognition, but a recognition that the orthopedic department now is in par uh, with transplantation, breast cancer, kidney transplant, ICU, polio vaccine, CPR and, uh, and the architect of uh, UPMC. I want to thank uh, Provost Patricia Beeson, who uh, I admire and I know for a long time, uh, just the, the academic uh, of the University of Pittsburgh in the right direction. Now I want to tell you a little bit about myself. 50 years ago, the world is not as simple as it was. Everything is far away, but right now I would say the world is flat and much more simple to reach. I come from Hong Kong and southern uh, tip of China, and uh, it's really far away. In fact, it's a 12 hour time zone uh, from Pittsburgh. My family came from Canton, Fatsan about 150 years ago uh, when Hong Kong was founded as a colony because of safety issue. You can see my great grandfather on the upper left, my grandfather getting married. Uh, and in those days, uh, it's not uncommon to have uh, quite a few wives. So my grandfather has four wives and so has my great grandfather. But my father, you can see in the lower left with mom, uh, only the only spouse they have, and my brothers and sister. Uh, the one 
that you see in the doctor's head uh, was my great grand uncle, uh, who was the first in the family to uh, go to university. Now, Fu Bingxiang uh, was a very interesting gentleman. Uh, he went to uh, the first class of the University of Hong Kong and graduated number one in the class. When he was uh, at school, he also met up with Sun and Sun, uh, who studied medicine and uh, who found modern China. And after school, they worked together and he had to write a basic law for modern China. Later, uh, he was uh, appointed um, the ambassador to Russia, and as well as um, signing the treaty, so-called the Moscow Treaty in 1943, which is a precursor uh, to the United Nations. And China, USA, France, England, and Russia are the five of veto member. He passed away in 65, and uh, his children still uh, live in London, England. Now, after our family moved to Hong Kong 150 years ago and become successful in business, uh, my great-great-grandmother decided to donate uh, 10 um, schools uh, back to Fasan uh, because uh, they feel like education is a key uh, to success and, of, of course, avoid uh, people going into bad things like robbery, kidnapping, things like that. So you can see on the left, as they say, Fasan, number three uh, school, and still exists today. The grounds is the same. And on the right, this is a temple uh, within the school to honor uh, my great-great-great-great-grandmother. Now, I went to a very uh, old school in Hong Kong. It was founded in 1851, only 10 years after the British took over Hong Kong. And here I was in probably I was a freshman in high school. And, um, and our school actually was the oldest school uh, in Hong Kong and have produced some quite famous alumni, including the uh, architect, uh, I.M. Pei, who uh, went from St. Paul's to MIT and then uh, have really um, you know, done many, many famous uh, buildings. The other gentleman, very famous, was Cheng Cheng. Now, you may not know him, but you can Google him. Uh, he was my classmate. Uh, in Hong Kong, um, school system, like the British system, there is something called a head prefect, the head boy, and Cheng Cheng was the head prefect. And I was the second prefect to work under him. Uh, it's almost like administration um, students. And basically, Cheng Cheng later worked for Singapore Strict Time, uh, was arrested in China, uh, in jail for 1,000 days, and was released. He was never formally charged, uh, but he's still uh, very uh, positive towards the whole uh, China and Hong Kong, and have written this book called A Thousand Days in Jail. I wasn't the best student in Hong Kong. I take, take part in many art activities such as rock and roll band, uh, newspaper writing. And the highlight was my basketball team, uh, which uh, won the uh, Hong Kong so-called Grade A championship. Uh, we have a perfect unbeaten season, and we actually score more than 100 points in three of um, our matches, which uh, was unheard of that time and unheard of today. And behind you can see all the coaches and teachers now, I decided that I must uh, study somewhere else because uh, Hong Kong U is uh, rich for me to get in, very selective and hard to get in. So uh, the teacher for my school really recommended I should go to Donald's College. And unfortunately, I got accepted. And uh, I went by uh, Preston's Cliffin, which is a ocean liner that go across from Hong Kong to Philippines to Japan, Hawaii. San Francisco. This is just uh, before I left with all my high school classmates, and of course uh, Hilda, whom I just met a month uh, before, and uh, she was um, a uh, rock star uh, 
her group is called Tomorrow Seven Minus One. It's probably the first all girls group singing group in Hong Kong. What you just heard was a song sent by uh, Hilda's group, Tomorrow 7 Minus 1. Um, they are featured on television, I have a recording, and um, they are very popular. And I feel like that I was a true three boyfriend and now husband. Arrived uh, in the famous Golden Gate Bridge, uh, and it was a wonderful you know, opportunity for me at the time. Uh, the songs on the radio uh, are Crackling Rosie and Knock Three Times by Tony Orlando. And of course, there's a song by New Diamond called Sweet Caroline, too. I went into Hanover, New Hampshire, Dartmouth College, and I spent five years there, three years in undergraduate and two years in medical school. Uh, I was inspired. Uh, I was motivated and I find many good friends and mentors there. At Dunlop, I have uh, many mentors, and I was fortunately to be taught by President John Kemmerly, uh, who was uh, working with the Manhattan Project um, from Princeton before he uh, became a math professor and president at Dunlop. Uh, he actually taught me freshman calculus, which is uh, very inspiring. And of course, Professor Roy Foster, biological uh, professor who really inspired me into medicine. Hilda and I got married to my parents and, uh, and uh, her mom in Winnipeg, Canada. It's uh, interesting because uh, I was in Hanover and Hilda was in Hong Kong and we decided to meet up in Winnipeg where my sister lived at the time and had a wedding. And from then the dean of the medical school at Dartmouth, uh, Dr. Strickler, uh, was from Marlborough, Mar Pennsylvania, he recommended I should go to Strick to work with um, a giant in orthopedic surgery called Albert B. Ferguson, because that was my interest. And uh, when I arrived, uh, it's quite a polluted um, you know, city, but I was accepted into the transfer program to finish my final two years at Pitt Medical School. Uh, by uh, Dean uh, Harbison. Pittsburgh have changed quite a bit. Those are some pictures I took of the fall season. Uh, of note was the picture on the lower right. Uh, it took me two hours because I did not know in the winter time, uh, you know, the cable car only work when there were people in there. So there's only three runs in that last uh, two hours. It's freezing cold. So I entered my orthopedic training, and I was uh, really uh, in awe with Professor Ferguson and many faculty. Uh, Dr. Ferguson uh, came from Boston in 1953 and is recruited by Dean Willem McElroy. McElroy was uh, very instrumental to put you know, the medical school where it is today. He helped build the whole scave hall and recruited many um, well-known research scientists and start many <coughs> residency programs. So there are five chairs in 100 years, Dr. Silver, Dr. Steele, Dr. Ferguson, who started the residency and research laboratory, and Dr. Herndon, who really specialized uh, all subspecialty and uh, inspect, expanded determined tremendously. He w went on to become the professor at Harvard, so-called the Partners uh, Program, and I succeeded him in 1998. These are, these are some of the old pictures. 
from the file. And we are actually uh, getting on an online to try to ID everybody. So do not, you know, after you watch the last slide, please stay on because we're going to put all those pictures uh, with a uh, label of persons on it uh, at the end of my talk. But you can see Henry Nankin, who was a pit uh, class of 53, went on to become a professor at Harvard and NGH for almost 25 years. Uh, Bill Donaldson, and uh, who was uh, working with uh, Dr. Ferguson to uh, make us a first-rated orthopedic training program. So there are many mentors uh, for myself, we call it the Ferg year, and uh, many uh, would agree that this is probably the best orthopedic program uh, in the country uh, at the time in the 60s and 70s. And we try to get back to as good as what Ferguson has done. And on the right, you can see Bill Green, Mark Pittman, Ed Hanley, and Dan Mears. Those all are giants uh, in our field. I graduated from residency in 82, and those are my uh, residency mate. Uh, and with Ferguson in the library, we really have a good rapport, and we still keep in touch uh, with all of them. Now, our program uh, is big in education, research, and clinical care. So we train more than 1,500 residents and fellows from all over the world. This is an article in the Pitt Med Magazine in 2002, uh, and gives you some idea of the people we train. Um, and in fact, in the 60s, 70s, uh, we were called a Camelot, like uh, Dr. Ferguson is the uh, knight, and with the round table, all these uh, knights are going to come and report to him and talk to him. So in the 60s, 70s, Pitt was in the middle, and Cleveland Clinic, Hershey, West Virginia, Ohio State, all the chair were trained by Ferguson at the time. Now, you also received a bookmark, uh, which I provided for the medical student during a Wacker ceremony speech. Uh, not too long ago. But those are 20 facts, or I would say philosophy, that I learned uh, in the last 50 years, all the way from high school uh, to medical school, my residency training. So read it. I think it may be of um, use uh, to you. Uh, also, I will have the message uh, from this throughout my talk. Now, in terms of research, uh, there are two big categories, biological and biomechanics, in our field. Uh, and I'm going to share with you uh, what happened in the last 60 years. I would say just our uh, early years of research, we drew into both anatomy and basic Catholic research, from Dr. Brower all the way to Bill Green. Now, doctors, Dom, doctors, Thomas Brown took advantage of the laboratory that Professor Ferguson set up and study really Catholic physiology. Uh, he looked at growth plate as well as how Catholic survive because a Catholic, uh, Highland Catholic is um, a vascular, a neural, and he find out they survive uh, by diffusion of the control sites. And Dr. Thomas Brown went on to become the professor and first chairman in Kentucky Next came a local boy, Henry Mankin, who grew up in Squirrel Hill, went to Autodice High School, was classmate with a sportcaster in Myron Cope. They lived on the same street. While at the um, pit as a faculty, he studied the basic science of uh, cartilage. So he's the first to show that the cartilage site actually is a very active uh, structure, they are my, my talk to. And uh, because for years we thought that the island cartilage or the control site, they are uh, really inactive. The other study he did is to show uh, something interesting. Now let's roll back 50 years about Dr. Philip Hench, who was a graduate from the class of 20 
went on to went into the Nobel Prize when he was in Mayo Clinic uh, to essentially looking at steroid effect uh, on various conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. But Dr. Mencken actually find that if we inject steroids into the knee, for example, uh, you feel better, but it's all also, but you are actually calming down the synovial reaction uh, to inflammation. Uh, the steroid actually potentially harm the uh, control sites uh, and make it not active. So the next two gentlemen are George Bentley, who actually come from England and met up with Ferguson when he was a so-called ABC training fellow at Oxford. So he came over for a two-year uh, research fellowship working with uh, Dr. Greer, who was the director of our lab at the time. Uh, they did something very novel in taking cells from Carthage and rabbits, grow in monolayer culture, and put it back into the defect. Uh, and it was published in Nature, which at the time was unheard of for other people's research, and even today. Now, this is a precursor uh, of some exciting research 25 years later uh, that was done in Sweden. Uh, they did the same thing in human beings. So this is a really the, the basis whereby all this so-called cell therapy uh, started. At the same time, William Green, um, he actually uh, came from Harvard, went to NIH uh, for two years, and came to Pittsburgh. Uh, his father, William Green Sr., uh, was a professor uh, at Harvard Pediatric orthopedic and was actually a mentor of uh, Professor Ferguson. Uh, what Dr. Green found is if you want to um, have cell therapy, if you grow cells in culture, you must need a three-dimensional environment uh, for these cells to regain their phenotypes. For example, if you put uh, Highland uh, cartilage with uh, control sites into a culture, many of them become fibroblasts if you do monolayer. If you put it in a 3D matrix, uh, they will become highland uh, cartilage and control sites. Uh, so this is what happened today. Now people 25 years later or 30 years later are uh, taking cells from human being, grow in culture, and uh, put it back in. It was a New England article journal uh, back in 93 and followed by now more study on 3D matrix to allow these uh, cells to grow properly. I really believe that uh, these five gentlemen are the pioneer in tissue engineering, uh, a term that was not found until the late 80s. And I believe that um, Dr. Benling, Dr. Green, and Dr. Greer may deserve the nomination for Nobel Prize because this is uh, a pioneer work that was uh, overlooked uh, until years later that uh, people follow up what they did and uh, apply the same principle in human being. Now, as you can see, the holy grail for our field is to replenish the damaged cartilage. Now, the simple way is to have a joint replacement, which is a very effective operation. But I think if you are young, and if you have damage like in the middle, uh, the question is how can we replenish it back to hymen cartilage? And this is still uh, an open uh, question, not quite uh, definitely can be um, answered. At the same time in the mid or late 70s, I was in the lab and Dr. Ferguson just hired Tom Brown, a fresh PhD from the mechanical engineering uh, department at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Brown walked into TK Hong, and he uh, actually had some very good pioneer work having me put this piston electrics under the patella and measure the pressure. Um, and we also did uh, work on final element and analysis uh, and published all those um, early biomechanical um, work. Now, Thomas Brown, uh, after working five years with us, went on to become uh, the research head at Iowa and now has retired and become the associate editor of uh, our JPGS. 
A medical student, Mark Barrett, uh, came along and won some research projects. So we find some newer uh, technique uh, called Fuji film, and the hot topic is uh, is really the is the meniscus important? The washer between the two knee. Now, of course, for years we just took it out and think that it's nothing that, that serious because we thought it's rudimentary. But we saw people with wear and tear uh, of the meniscectomy. So by putting this Fuji film, uh, look at contact pressure. Uh, Mark uh, was able to find out that if you do a partial meniscectomy, you are essentially putting much more stress of, uh, on between the cartilage. So this is a classic study. And the data haven't changed. There may be newer equipment. And Mark uh, went on to become uh, a very famous hand surgeon in Pittsburgh. And he's also the presence of the Hand Society a few years ago. So what you're seeing right now are uh, work by another medical student, Bill Thompson. Uh, this is an incredible study because it was done in the late 80s where MI just come out. He had senior MI to show the medial and lateral meniscus uh, not that rudimentary, but a very active uh, structure that moved back and forth uh, during uh, motion. When we first showed this uh, MI in Japan, uh, people almost fell off, um, you know, the chair. And Bill went on to HSS, uh, become a uh, sports uh, medicine specialist in New York. Now, there are two gentlemen who did tremendous research uh, in the wear particles. Dana Mears, a uh, Pittsburgh native, father was the head of US Steel uh, Science Investigation, and he went on to uh, study in uh, Oxford and Cambridge, uh, have a medical plus a PhD degree in material science. And Chris Evans come from uh, England too, uh, Swansea University, and is expert in looking at uh, wear particles using some technical ferrography uh, in oil. So we actually, at the time, uh, stick needles in the knees, including my own knee, uh, and get wear particles cell from the knees and study what happened with these wear particles, find out that they induce um, cytokines and uh, maybe cause uh, possible great changes. Now with this in mind, we face a big clinical problem in the mid-80s people start to put artificial ligament, like the Gore-Tex graph on the left side into the knees. And the marketing uh, ploy is that the patient will come back very fast. But very quickly when this ligament fail, uh, we find wear particles everywhere and cause severe synovitis. Eric Olsen, a uh, resident with us uh, who went to Princeton, is a uh, name of fame is he designed the ultimate free 3 course at Princeton. And together with Jim Kang, uh, Helga, Greg Mason, and Chris Evans, we study wave particles by creating wave particles using an ingenious technique, uh, liquid nitrogen, nine minus 90 degree, and then from back the cortex with magnetic field until the right wave particles you know, uh, being created. Then we inject this particle into rabbit knees and bingo, this reproduces the same synovitis and damage your cartilage as a human being. So this paper actually um, really, I would say, helped the patient tremendously because essentially artificial ligament was now never being used in America anymore. Uh, the, the French has invented a lot of those and they don't use it either, except now they're selling some of this in China. Now this is the mechanism. The wear particles interact with the synovium and cause the cytokines uh, release and cause damage to your cartilage. So actually this also inspired one of the um, faculty, Dr. Harry Rubash. Uh, Rubash um, family come from uh, Plum, you know, uh, outside of Pittsburgh. And, um, he is a Harry is a very accomplished scholar, is a university uh, scholar, and have a full scholarship uh, from P Medical School. So he also used the same idea to study where in total joint replacement. Of course, Harry um, went on to become uh, the chief of uh, orthopedic at Mass General, uh, and he just retired uh, you know, recently in 2016. 
Now, the work on wave particles inspired Dr. Herndon and Dr. Evans. And they say, why don't we now have some technique using a new biological um, you know, weapon called gene therapy? Uh, maybe we can suppress some of those uh, cytokines by using a um, you know, enzyme called IREC. And the way to deliver this IREC into leukine receptor autogenous is to using gene therapy technique uh, to put virus into synovium, and the, the synovium will, re will release the IREC and suppress cytokines. So they have 10 trial patients, uh, rheumatoid patient uh, with a finger that Dr. Herndon operated on. And they find this to be safe and, you know, kind of uh, reliable. Unfortunately, gene therapy went into uh, some difficulty because of some death uh, from France and from Philadelphia because of either uh, some uh, genome manipulation uh, and by allergy. So gene therapy become uh, not used uh, for a long time suppressed. Uh, though the work they uh, produced was um, front page New York Times and published in the Proceeding of National Academy of Science later. Now, back in the 80s, uh, I was trying to be a sport medicine doctor. But we find the need to be difficult to crack into. There are many famous people already working on anatomy biomechanics, whereby the shoulder was wide open because it's a much more difficult um, joint to handle because it's quite loose. And unless you incorporate the muscle, uh, you cannot really study the shoulder. Uh, with the help of Tom Mushler, a CMU um, you know, engineering, uh, students that later become a residents and Paul Kane also a residents we actually start to build the first so-called dynamic shoulder model and it was uh, published uh, in 87 now with that in mind we work with uh, Dr. Debsky and JP Warner and others to build a more sophisticated model with funding from Whitaker Foundation now this model took about three years to build this um, smooth motion of this uh, shoulder is not as easy as you think it is because we have to put uh, the right force into the muscle attachment to make it uh, really move. And with that, we can study uh, many, many phase uh, of shoulder pathology. In the um, 1989, uh, we have Dr. Scott Lepard, a PhD um, from Virginia, who is coming to, to be the head of the um, trainer program uh, in the School of Education. Uh, we supported uh, Scott and collaborated with him uh, to actually have a lab in the tree saw to look at proprioception, uh, look at female ACL injury. And Scott became really successful working with us and actually moved into the new sports center and run a big lab um, basically in human performance. Scott now have left uh, to, uh, for Kentucky to be the dean of um, you know, LL Health Science there. But he left with us a you know, 11 uh, square foot um, you know, building, a uh, new neuromuscular lab under uh, Bradley Nidell. And basically, uh, we study basically um, you know, warrior human performance research um, the most. Of course, we have golfing, cycling, and female AC uh, injury too. So, so, for example, we are training on the Navy SEALs around the country uh, to prevent injury uh, during combat. Now, one of the most premier scientists in the world, uh, Dr. Zafi Wu from UCSD, uh, was recruited successfully to come to Pittsburgh in the early 90s by Dr. Herndon. And he bring uh, with him uh, many, many research, including so-called a robot. Uh, before him, all the study by biomechanics is two-dimensional. But the, with the robot, now we can study uh, cadavers in six degree of freedom or three-dimensional. So this allows us to really have a brand new way to look at biomechanics. And, uh, and we publish many, many papers, many grants. And of course, right now, the whole world have more than 20 robots uh, studying biomechanics. Dr. Wu uh, moved on to uh, School of Engineering, and he's still here uh, in the bioengineering department. At the same time, with uh, our 
partner in sport medicine, Chris Hanna, he also started to work for Dr. Wu in the PCL, became successful, uh, was funded with the ORIF grant. And with that, uh, he also uh, moved forward to look at the meniscus and had very su good success um, in the uh, biodynamic lab uh, also. But he uh, recently moved on to Texas, uh, become the vice chairman uh, there. Now let's move fast forward 25 years and with uh, Dr. Wu's uh, inspiration, uh, Dr. Musel, Dr. Debsky now collaborate and we're able to get a new robot. The robot we showed you earlier, uh, used robot by GM. So they're not really uh, programmed for human cadaver. We have to work real hard to make it happen. But the newer robot, uh, both processed in Japan, there's only, only, only one in America uh, that are um, designed just for cadaver study. So uh, now uh, with uh, the help of um, Chair of Bioengineering, Dr. Uh, Professor Borowitz, uh, we now open a new laboratory uh, looking at uh, all kind of um, problem in cadavers in terms of uh, shoulders problems, knee problems, and it's all programmed directly and it's very safe and uh, very small. Now in the mid 90s, um, Tony DeJoy was a uh, resident. Uh, he was trained in CMU engineering, but uh, he and when he came back, he worked with Dr. Mears in Shadyside and get funded from the Shadyside Foundation to start his uh, robotic um, navigation project in collaboration uh, with uh, CMU. Very successful. In fact, he's a world pioneer in navigation, and this is what everybody um, is doing nowadays in joint replacement and even in other field. And Tony is very successful, uh, and he's still uh, in the UPMC uh, McKee Women Hospital, uh, he's now more into quality control of healthcare. Now, there's a young Canadian, Johnny Hewitt. Uh, he was hired by Dr. Maury Mullen, um, you know, from pediatric uh, to look at muscular dystrophy. But when he, after he arrived, he not only looked at muscular dystrophy uh, for a cure, but he also um, invented uh, the muscle stem cells. So we are the probably only of the big laboratory that have our own cell line. Uh, so he did many studies on this in terms of calfish uh, muscle healing. Uh, now the only thing I would say um, that uh, we are very careful uh, not jumping in, into human trial because uh, they are good and bad part of our stem cells so we do understand in young people. Uh, and so we are still uh, not putting into uh, human too much at this point uh, in sport medicine. Um, Connie Chu was my first recruit as a clinician scientist, UCSD, Harvard Fellowship, and her expertise is cartilage research, especially uh, making early diagnosis with a technique called OCT, uh, which is, uh, you know, infrared uh, and also uh, neural cartilage imaging also uh, study uh, stem cells uh, approach healing. Uh, she is really successful, uh, and we actually have the help of Steve Shapiro, the School of Medicine, chair at the time, uh, providing some laboratory space on the trail floor of Skate Hall. Uh, and uh, now she, she actually eventually uh, was probably the top NIH um, funder in the um, clinician scientist a track in orthopedics up to $2 million a year. And Connie moved on to Stanford and had the research uh, program in Stanford orthopedics. Now, spine has been a stronghold uh, since Dr. Kang uh, took over years ago. And now with Dr. Lee, Dr. Vo, and uh, Dr. Silvers, uh, who uh, is the new chair of um, PMNR. Now, they work together to look at all phases of the spine, especially the disc, gene therapy, healing, uh, aging. Uh, so I think they love uh, study uh, and uh, grant. Uh, and I think Dr. Kang uh, left for Harvard, become chair at Brigham, but Dr. Lee and Vogt and so forth still carrying the torch. Dr. Wang uh, has been uh, for 15, 20 years uh, very focused on look at tendon uh, healing, 
look at single cell manipulation, uh, mechanical manipulation, and the effect on biological, um, you know, man, you know, uh, intervention on this manipulation. So he is heavily funded from the NIH, and uh, we're very proud uh, for him to work in the lab. New research uh, person is uh, Dr. Weiss, who was no, no stranger to us. He uh, he was in our lab as an undergraduate student. Uh, now he went to Notre Dame, but his, in his freshman year, uh, he was diagnosed uh, with a osteogenic uh, sarcoma in his uh, lower leg. Uh, he has amputation and prosthesis uh, done by Dr. Goodman, uh, and basically he uh, he overcame. This uh, adversity survive and uh, now become a doctor um, and go for a residency program and now is probably the, one of the most uh, respected uh, scientists uh, in orthopedic tumor with multiple publication grant uh, and collaboration uh, with the Human uh, Cancer uh, Center. Now our rock star, of course, is Rocky Tron. <laughs> he come from. Uh, Many PEF from Penn, Jefferson, and then NH uh, for 10 years, who is head of the, he is head of the Catholic Research there. So you can see from this slide, he has uh, many hats. He wears many hats uh, in, the, in the system. But essentially, he really can look from above, looking at uh, many mechanisms of um, stem cells, of matrices, uh, tissue uh, in the chip. And he even have a lab in NASA. Uh, to look at, uh, you know, healing of cartridges in space. So uh, we really have a lot of uh, good leadership and mentorship, and uh, with Dr. Chuan heading our research, uh, we are in really good hands. One of the problem in orthopedic is that we do not have very good outcome measurement. Like in cardiology with the EKG, but we do not have an EKG of the knee, for example until Dr. Tashman came around and uh, we get support from UPMC and the School of Medicine uh, to support the recruitment of Tashman building this uh, $3 million um, um, diamantic lab and just basically uh, looking at uh, knee kinematics, looking at ligament elongation, cartilage contact, and this is as good as an EKG of the knee we can do. So we have now objective data measurement and together with Dr. William Enhertz, we were able to not study the knee, but the spine, uh, TMJ joints, the hips, the ankle too. So it's a, really a core facility that used by many people. When we opened the UPMC Sports uh, Medicine Center on the south side in 1990, uh, one of the goals is to have a comprehensive uh, one-stop care for all sport injury. So uh, we decided to put in concussion and recruit Dr. Lovo and Dr. Collins, who uh, in really uh, have done a lot of research uh, into concussion, especially the early diagnosis. So with him, uh, now with Dr. Contos, we're really getting a very busy clinical uh, practice uh, in you know, in the sports center, plus a lot of research and collaboration with many other specialty uh, in UPMC and, uh, and National Football League too. So this is uh, probably the most respected concussion clinical program uh, in the world. So all this basic research are meaningless until we can translate it into clinical care. And also we have, have a way to look at the outcome and we cannot do it without uh, Dr. Jay Aragang, who oversees the whole um, IRP program and the outcome measurement in, uh, in all our orthopedic field. And I want to thank all the clinicians, which I cannot really mention all of them, that take part and written many, many papers, have over 250 IRP uh, and um, in the field of trauma, hand, pediatric, joint replacement, sport medicine, hand, foot and ankle. Um, and re really, this is a driving force of the training and education uh, of our residents, too. We live in a very unique environment here. About one and a half hour away from Pittsburgh is this beautiful entity called Falling Water, ruled by Frank Lot Wright, 
who told us study nature, love nature, stay close to nature will never fail you. Now, I think nature is also a medicine. Basically, many times we have to know more about nature because before we jump into intervention. Now, if you're going to do something not quite right and harm nature or harm our system, you may potentially do more harm than good. Uh, for example, in Pittsburgh, as you know, uh, the steel industry and pollution harm our water so much there's no fish there for years and we get 50 years of cleanup before you know we have enough fishes and or eagle uh, come back to Pittsburgh. So we have to respect nature tremendously. Now these are natures. You can see on the upper left uh, a, a video I took in Hilton Head uh, this summer and uh, you can see the powerful of this water sprout. Now interestingly my son was, uh, you can see he is still uh, serving out there and she, he will not come in. I keep telling him, you better get in. And he said, well, it's uh, only 10 miles away. It's good waves. But you can see they have beautiful fall season, beautiful sunset. You know, picture from Hawaii is absolutely astounding. Now, as for me, uh, I look at ACL surgery. So I want to share with you what I do. And in, uh, in 2014, I was uh, honored to receive the so-called Capital Delta Award, uh, so-called the Nobel of orthopedic computing with all fields. Uh, I actually tried uh, th three times before I won it. So the fourth tries is a uh, charm. Uh, I have more paper, uh, you know, more research, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, Pittsburgh and ACL have been recognized. Uh, we look at all phase of ACL research. You can see right here, uh, we have uh, funded for many organizations, including uh, clinical trial from NIH. Uh, we published more than 400 uh, papers in this field alone, uh, double uh, you know, anybody else in the world. Now this, we have a meeting every week uh, to discuss both the basic science and clinical application of ACL injury. For example, uh, this is uh, Dr. Petrit Mostolinsky. Uh, from the School of Engineering, who we'll work in his lab to look at um, anatomy, to look at some biomechanics, uh, working with Paul Galano, who is uh, from Spain, one of the foremost anatomists uh, in the world, looking at this fetus, uh, ACL, uh, right here. You can see when you were born, uh, we have fresh stillborn fetus. You can see those two bundles, uh, AM and PO bundle, uh, right there. We also look at animals. I was uh, on a neck brace because I was 10 days post-op by Dr. Donaldson and Dr. Kang for neck fusion. But Johnny Mandro, the monkey, cannot wait for my operation because everybody is ready. So essentially, uh, he has a uh, torn uh, partial tear of the ACL. You know, we, take, we take care of him and he's back uh, to his normal activities. So when animals go to you know, sleep for a, I would say every five to 10 years, 10-year examination. Uh, they look at the whole body from top to bottom, but we look at the knees. Uh, lion, polar bear, monkeys, tiger. And when they uh, pass away in the Pittsburgh Zoo, we harvest the body part and look at the A cell the morphology. You can see animals have very specific bony attachment of the A cell. One is AM bundle, two is intermediate, three is PL bundle. So, so there are actually more bundles than a human being. Now, if you look at these two pic this pictures, on the human knee has two bundles, animals have three bundles. Sometimes humans also have three bundles. So there's a gradation from human to animals. And if you look at the bone morphology, Basically, human and gorilla are very different. Look at the gorilla, have a much bigger size of medial size, and there are more rotation uh, possibility. You can see the difference between human and gorilla right here. We also look at Lucy, uh, older specimen. This is uh, with Oven Lovejoy, National Academy of Science um, appointee, and uh, 
he took out Lucy from Ethiopia 40 years ago. Uh, luckily, Lucy has a, has a TP and FEMA, so I can study the attachment uh, of the A-cell. Uh, you can see on Lucy CAT scan, you can see the resin rich like we saw in modern human being. So the lesson to learn from modern system of bone morphology dictate uh, the motion, and the ligament have to guide it. So the bone morphology in the long run may be more important than the ligament, and it will dictate the size and, in, and, the, uh, uh, and also the attachment of this ligament. But the lesson also to learn is do not put the ligament in the wrong place, because if you put it in the wrong place, you're going to produce some poor kinematics. So form follows function, as you can see. The bone will uh, all different in different specimens, and so are the A-cell or the ligament. So in the future, we must de devote more of our research into bone morphology and how it um, really dictates how the knee moves. There are many uh, young clinician scientists. I don't have time to go into all the details. Dr. Von der Wright, Dr. Urich, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Hogan and uh, Dr. Thomas Lucito, Anna Reynolds, and Rebecca uh, Waters. They're all research faculty, uh, bright stars for the future. Now, if you look at this picture, there was a Christmas um, you know, party we had for, for Versa Ferguson about five, six years ago. And everybody uh, was so happy and smiling. And those are the days when I was trained. All those people are my uh, residency mate, or, you know, uh, you know, my mentors. One thing you notice, there are no female <laughs> in this picture, but this is how orthopedic were. But this is what happened today. So we respect the past, but we must embrace the future. Now our department is 20, 25% female, plus, uh, you know, different ethnic background. Uh, and uh, I think this allows us to really have a very uh, good department to really pick the best people for the job and also create an environment that we understand different ethnic background, different um, you know, gender, sensitivity towards that. It's very, very important. Now in the middle is uh, Glory Beam. He was a, a physics professor uh, last year. And now he, she was very special because she was a first sports fellow in 96. Uh, that we accepted a um, uh, you know, woman sport fellow. And one other thing we did is we put her right into the men's football team in the locker room under Johnny Major at the time. And Johnny Major really accepted Gloria. And I think that built up her confidence to be very successful. Now, Gloria, incredible, later became the chief medical officer for the USA OC. She oversees the whole Winter Olympic in uh, Russia. And also, she was separately named the uh, chief medical officer for the uh, Paralympic Olympic, both in 2012 and 2016. So, always respect the past, but we have to embrace the future. And we also are very proud to receive the first year award from AOS for the work uh, we have done in CRISPR uh, for the sake of really for for the. Ten, a better um, human, uh, you know, interaction in orthopedics. Now, this are uh, 100 years anniversary in 2009. Uh, we actually have this celebration just at Grand Round instead of a big party at night. At the time, there was a financial crisis in the country, and uh, every institution are cutting, uh, you know, off people, letting people go. So we decided to not spend money on a big party. Instead, we have uh, two kicks, and Connie Chu bring in her Westbourne uh, knife to cut the kick with, together with Dr. Ferguson. So you can see many people here, Mary Crossgrove, Dr. McMaster, uh, and of course, we want to thank Donaldson. Uh, you know, Dr. Donaldson, who's um, passed away, but he is a big part of our program. And also Dr. Ed Halley, who was interim chairman uh, between Ferguson uh, and Herndon, and he went on to become the head of uh, Carolina Medical Center Orthopedic, uh, and very, very successful there. Now, we cannot do it uh, without the Pittsburgh Orthopedic Alumni Association. Started by Peter Cohen and Jenny Cohen, uh, 
Uh, and we always get spoiled by, by, by just two people when we're residents, taking care of all the residents, uh, going to those uh, luncheon and meetings. And now, since I've become the chair, um, Dr. Jack Smith and George L. Smith uh, took over, and they've been doing a fantastic job. As you know, Jack is also, um, you know, uh, on the board of trustee of the University of Pittsburgh and very active um, as a surgeon in Greensburg, as well, you know, as an University of Pittsburgh athletic department. Now, this is uh, a letter sent to me from Professor Ferguson back in 1977. So it reads, we have talked so much that we feel that we have things all settled, but we ought to formal, formalize this to make sure that you really uh, accept it for the July 79, that you are definitely coming. We also have you down as a laboratory gentleman beginning July the 1st, 78. This is an exciting job, and uh, Bob Rutowski is joining it right now. So please grab a fine quill pen and inform us of your acceptance of this two moves on the checkerboard of your life. So when I read his letter, I was um, overjoyed, but of course, um, the way that Dr. Ferguson wrote it is uh, exceptional too. Inspire me, excite me, and really see me in the right path. So like he always said, do the right thing, and take good care of the patient. There are some outstanding people in Pittsburgh that I would say really uh, look after me. One of them is Lordy Falk, the founder of the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. Um, the family uh, donated money for the Falk Clinic, and even the Chancellor of Residence was one, once upon a time the Falk Residence, and they donated the whole residence uh, to be the uh, Chancellor Mansion. One of the things she did is to found the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater, and I became uh, the doctor for the ballet in 82 because Ferguson asked me to uh, help them. And we actually had the first dance symposium in 85. So uh, this really is a long-standing relationship uh, between uh, beautiful culture and sport medicine. And actually, I get a part of it too. Malibin uh, School District invited me to be the team doctor and I was embraced and accepted by the legendary coach Lada Walker uh, for a Chinese boy who never played uh, football to take care of all this player. We have great experience. We've been doing the Malibin for 34 years and now Volker Michelle uh, took care of the team uh, right now. And there are many interesting incidents. For example, in the first game, one of the players have a fractured femur. I have to hold the uh, leg on the field for 30 minutes before ambulance came. And this is how we convince every high school to uh, have an ambulance on site when they have playing football Friday night. Also, I have a chance to visit many, many schools uh, when they, uh, for the away game, including, for example, Ringo, where Joe Montana play, uh, Brook High School, where Lou Holtz come from, Newcastle, uh, where they have the first night game in uh, America with a light night they erected, and they have fireworks every time they score a touchdown. Now, Art's son was a ball boy when I started, but now he is a very uh, good coach in North Allegheny also. I'd like to thank especially Chancellor West Bosfer, who passed away a few years ago, who really took great care of uh, athletic and, and school. Also, um, his uh, family uh, here today at the lecture. Um, also, a big part, uh, you know, of the whole Pitt family. Now, as you can see from this peanut uh, cartoon that Dr. Postel sent to me uh, personally, um, and you can read through it. It's kind of uh, funny, but he also um, sent this letter to come along with that. He said, "I thought this episode of Peanuts is a timely and fitting commentary." as we pursue our professional course. Whatever happens, win, loss, or draw, we must remember the boss the thing, and he thanks for his support. 
and the road watches, of course, agree with that too. Now, the team of Jeff Romoff and Tom Detry is absolutely a dynamic duo that drives the whole uh, UPMC uh, into where they are today. I have the chance to see the elephants uh, one day at uh, Shasatya Kwai Mini Hospital and also invite me to a big meeting in the Western Psych in the uh, mid 80s to start Port Medicine. I think the idea of what they see is Port Medicine is a good specialty that should be recognized within the academic center, but also as a blending name for UPMC. So the, at that time, branding is not even an entity that people talk about, but they had a vision uh, to look at how to market sport medicine uh, to the whole community or the whole country, the whole world, so that people will recognize UPMC. But these two gentlemen are absolutely visionary uh, and I think that you know, we won't be here today uh, without them. Now, I want to thank the Athletic Department. This is Jerome Lane doing this incredible slam dunk. It is the ESPN number one all-time highlight. And of course, uh, I was sitting right behind that basket with Tony Slacy, uh, the head trainer for the last 30 years working with me in basketball. I want to thank Tony and all the athletic staff and the, also the AD, all the players. Now, the other one that I work with is Rob Lang, a trainer for 30 years in football. For example, we're working with Curtis Martin, 94, for a string ankle that we keep him out for 10 games. Uh, but Scott Curtis Martin actually recognized this is the right thing to do. And just uh, two years ago, Curtis invited me to attend his Hall of Fame uh, ceremony in Canton, Ohio. Uh, it's really uh, a touching moment for me because I never really operate on Curtis. I just say that you should rest and not, not let nature heal you to allow you to now play in the NFL for a good you know, 12, 14 years. The city is fantastic. This is why I stay in Pittsburgh. People like Mayor, Kalajuri and Sophie Maslow, unfortunately, both have passed away. And I worked with these two mayor diligently on the Pittsburgh Marathon. Uh, at that time, uh, we had a medical team uh, with uh, UPMC supporting, uh, with uh, T.K. Miller, uh, Mike Bowman, Larry Groman, and others to uh, plow the course, and also Larry Kaspanko, who is the race director. Later, actually, I became the chairman of the board of the marathon and has raised uh, money to sustain the marathon for a number of years. But right now, I think the marathon is one of the top 10 marathon in the world. And you can see the mass, mass, uh, medical team is very sophisticated. We also were able to invite the emergency medicine back in the 85 to get involved. There was a brand new department under Dr. Stewart. And we actually, our first medical um, doctor we work with is Vince Verdell, who now become the dean of the Albany Medical School. And of course, Ron Rolf is now the medical director uh, working with us, with uh, Dr. Marius and Dr. Anderson uh, in the marathon uh, medical care. The Rooney family is outstanding. They've been in Pittsburgh forever. And Pittsburgh Silla is equal uh, Pittsburgh, you know, uh, you know, the city itself. And with the vision of the Roonies uh, with uh, Mark Nordenberg uh, and UPMC, Tom Detry and Romoff, and we were able to build the UPMC Southside Sports Center on the 60 acres of old steel mill. And this is a, a classic uh, collaboration that other institutions try to imitate, but they could not quite uh, because of a strong tie with all these three entities. This is one of the most respected sports centers in the world. And we attract almost 800 uh, fellows from over the world uh, to have educated uh, research and clinical care there. Now, another mayor I have to mention is Thomas Murphy, uh, who at that time, when we built a sports center, he uh, ran down all the time to check out our progress. Now, Tom, as a marathon runner, and also a biker, so he's, he's very passionate to make sure that the Allegheny Trail uh, passed through the south side. So he and I agreed that 
For example, the outdoor training field should be only 80 yards long because the railroad track is on your right side and the bike trail is on your left side. So if you go to, go to 100 yards outdoor field, the bike trail will be gone. So uh, you have to thank uh, Mayor Murphy and a little bit myself to push for this to happen. Because now the Allegheny Trail goes through the south side from Pittsburgh all the way to Washington, D.C. And uh, two miles down the trail from us, uh, you can see the first return of the American Bald Eagle Nest to Pittsburgh. They were gone 100 years. And they just returned two years ago. And the first year, they laid three eggs, and they all survived. Now, last year, we opened the Mirror Le Mule Sport Performance Complex uh, in the north. And Dr. Wright is a medical director. Uh, basically, I met uh, Mario back in 86 when the visionary Dr. Detry already doing a fundraiser for cancer, uh, you know, in the Hyatt Hotel uh, downtown. And of course, Mario became a legendary player and owner. And with him, we were able to build this incredible complex about 20 miles from downtown uh, to take care of uh, medical problem as well as have uh, indoor practice field for the penguins. And you can see Miro with the brand new Stanley Cup ring right here from 2016. Other people would like to thank, including Steve Shapiro, who is driving UPMC, Mark Lundberg, the Chancellor uh, of University of Pittsburgh previously, uh, Marshall Webster in general surgery, who provided me with the first patient uh, as a medical student at Presby, general surgeon Charles Watson, who is an uh, inspiration and is a fantastic teacher, the late Maureen Morland uh, in our department who uh, really drive um, and really give him all to our department to make it uh, successful. I was very fortunately when I become chair at Pitt, uh, Dr. Levine also arrived at the same time and with him, uh, he drive the uh, research arm of um, our department as well as the whole uh, Pitt uh, to a highest level we are now top five NIH uh, granting agent, you know, in the country. And, uh, and in fact, personally, I received my first R01 grant at the age of 60, uh, almost 60, um, you know, uh, with the help and inspiration from Dr. Levine. So I would say the sun, the moon, all will follow him. Our new chancellor, Patrick Gallagher and Karen Gallagher, right here, a really, really inspiration to all of us. It's uh, really driving uh, the force to allow us to work with industry and have new ideas to, uh, to meet material uh, much easier in, in medicine. So I want to thank uh, both of them, especially um, uh, my pictures now displays uh, on the entrance hallways uh, of his uh, mansion as a permanent collection. So the next time if you have a chance to visit his, uh, his mansion, please look at those uh, 19 pictures. So every cloud has a silver lining, a picture I took uh, from this shiny Oval. So in 1994, I was uh, recruited by Penn to be the chairman, the oldest medical school, oldest department in the country. And after a lot of uh, back and forth, uh, I decided not to go. Uh, at the time, I wasn't even a chairman. I wasn't promised uh, a sport medicine complex. Uh, the reason why I say because my wife Hilda and myself decided the people in Pittsburgh are so good uh, that we must uh, stay because of the people. And in fact, Dr. Detry also spent some time uh, to discuss uh, this with me too. I want to thank him tremendously. Nothing is more important than your home, which is just your base. So I think all of you should spend time with your family, your kids, grandkids, uh, remember the birthdays, the anniversary, go to all the activities they do. You enjoy it, and they will also enjoy it. Now, I came to this country in 70 from a British Crown colony, and basically, I never have a concept what a country is like. So when I become a citizen in 1992, every time they play the national anthem, uh, I get chills in my you know, whole body, and still do today because I now I belong to a country. And I must tell you, my American dream come true. This country provide me with everything I need to be successful. It's a great country. 
and I think that all of you, sh you know, I'm sure agree with me. Uh, there may be ups and downs, but I think there are much, much, much more goodness than you can ever imagine. Well, lastly, this is uh, called configural learning, and for me, is uh, learning for airflow. So I think um, Pip really started a very good tradition with this building in the 1920s, and this is reminding to all of us, have an open mind, don't be a dinosaur, you can always learn from others. Now lastly, you may ask me, if uh, I have to do it over again, uh, what would I have done? Now I, I love music, so is my wife. So I think if I'm going to be born again, I'd like to be born in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and I would like to go to high school uh, with people like Barbara Streisand, Paul Simon, New Sidaka, and maybe with Dill Nyman, because he is one of the song that was so popular when I first arrived 46, seven years ago that we were just singing it the other night at the pit game. Listen. Thank you very much.